He planned the attack against Israel on April 13th. Ayatollah Ali Khamenei is expected to become the next supreme leader of Iran. He is one of the hidden actors of the Iranian revolution of 1979. The new regime allowed him to become a prosecutor without studying law. He rose through the ranks in his legal career. He was one of the four judges on the death committee in 1988. He was elected president of Iran in an election in which almost half of the country's citizens did not participate. He has ruled Iran since 2021, after the religious leader, of course. This week's guest in profile is Ibrahim Raisi, the eighth president of Iran. Before starting the video, if you would like to thank us for our efforts, you can subscribe to our channel. And thank you for your comments on the videos. We need you to subscribe so that we can do more and better. Thank you in advance for your support. If you have subscribed, let's move on. Sayyid Ibrahim Raisul Sadati. He grew up in the city of Mashhad, an important religious center for Shiites, in the last month of 1960. What makes Mashhad important? Mashhad is where Imam Reza, the eighth religious leader of the Shiites, is buried. He was born here in 1339 in the Hijri calendar. That's 1960. His mother and father are both descendants of Sadat Hussein, going straight back to Zayd bin Ali bin al Husseini, the founder of Zaydism. He lost one of his parents, his father, when he was only five years old. He started school and education. After elementary school, he went to the seminary in Qom. It was at this seminary that Iran's religious leader, Ali Hosseini Khamenei, was educated. There were some of the most prominent Islamic scholars in Iran. Raisi studied under some of them. While at the university, he completed his research in jurisprudence and law, earning a master's degree. And he wrote a doctoral dissertation in the fields of law and sharia, completing his doctoral degree with high marks. When Raisi first entered this seminary, even before he started university, the 1979 revolution, also known as the Islamic Revolution in Iran, was only a few years away. At the time, many Iranians were dissatisfied with the rule of Muhammad Reza Shah Pahlavi. At the age of 16, he had already begun to participate in protests. At that time, the insulting of Imam Khomeini in the information newspaper led to the beginning of popular movements. Raisi participated in the meetings of these protests. He had even formed the nucleus of these protests with his friends at Khan Madrasa. These were revolutionary students. Raisi's job was to keep in touch with revolutionary academics who had been released from prison or were in exile. Raisi also participated in meetings of clerics and academics at Tehran University, such as sit-ins. Let me quickly and briefly tell you why and how the Iranian revolution happened. I will tell you this because the main hero of this revolution, Khomeini, was the idol of this week's guest, Ibrahim Raisi. Raisi was also involved in this revolution. Let's get started. According to his opponents, what was wrong with former President Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi? Why was he drawing the ire of Khomeini and his supporters? Because he was going to implement the US-backed plan to expand privatization and encourage foreign investment. He was being criticized as a supporter of the US and Israel. Khomeini was constantly opposed to the Shah, openly condemning him and sometimes even insulting him as Yazid. According to him, the Shah's regime was violating the provisions of Islam and the Constitution. Khomeini made many such accusations against the Shah. Do not think that these accusations went unanswered. Khomeini was imprisoned many times and exiled from place to place for decades. During these periods of exile, he had a lot of time to think and write, especially about politics and statecraft. One day he wrote something that gave the revolutionaries the infrastructure necessary to establish a state in the absence of the missing Imam, which is an important part of the Shiite faith, the famous theory of Velaya Tufaqi. Now, in the absence of the Imam, the Faqis, the clerics, would be the heirs of the Imam and could rule the state. Previously, they had no belief or obligation to establish an Islamic state before such an Imam. What changed all of a sudden, you ask? 
Khomeini's article that increased the powers of the clerics changed everything. This new interpretation gave the Shiite cadres in Iran a legitimate basis to aspire to power. The protest escalated, but now the regime's response was also very harsh. From the killing of Khomeini's son to the storming of schools by soldiers, the regime's response was bloody. Even commemorative demonstrations were suppressed by soldiers killing dozens of people. Commemorations swept Iran and millions took to the streets. A few months later, on January 16, 1979, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi contracted lymphoma and left Iran, moving to Egypt as a political refugee. Just two weeks later, Khomeini, now called the Imam, returned to Iran. He came with 120 journalists to make sure that nothing happened to his plane. The Shah's appointed government was also overthrown and the revolution was complete. As soon as Khomeini arrived in his country where he was welcomed with joy, he appointed a provisional Islamic government. As a result of a referendum held shortly afterwards, Iran was recognized as the Islamic Republic. The constitution was velayat e faqi Those who chose the republic to get rid of the iron fist of the Shah were met with Khomeini's fist. Ibrahim Raisi was one of Khomeini's loyal followers who worked for the revolution. After the Islamic revolution, he attended a special training course organized to create cadres to meet the administrative needs of the new Islamic system. The revolution needed officials. In 1981, 20-year-old Ibrahim Raisi, who had not yet made any serious progress in his education, was appointed prosecutor, first in Karaj and then in Hamadan, on the grounds that loyalty to the revolution was more important than knowledge and that there was a vacancy in the cadres. In 1985, he became the deputy prosecutor of the capital, Tehran. In 1988, his powers were further expanded. He could issue death sentences. In the so-called 1989 massacre, his role was serious. 1988, Raisi was part of the death committee formed by Khomeini after the Iran-Iraq war, which carried out political executions. He was one of those who ordered the execution of political prisoners, estimated to number between 3,800 and 20,000, who were executed en masse in Iranian prisons. Because of this background, he is, of course, highly criticized by the current opposition. Even though he now has a doctorate in law and so on, at that time he was a prosecutor without a law degree. Because of this role, he is known among the opposition as the Ayatollah of the Massacre. Amnesty International has even gone a step further and called for Racy to face charges of crimes against humanity. As deputy prosecutor of Tehran, Racy did all this and, of course, rose steadily in his career. In 1989, Khomeini died. With his death, Raisi's teacher Khamenei became the religious leader, taking Khomeini's position. Ibrahim Raisi became Tehran's prosecutor. He then rose even higher. Five years later, in 1994, he became the chief prosecutor of the Special Court for Clerics. And in 2004, he became the deputy of Mahmoud Shahroudi, then president of Iran's Constitutional Court. When Sadek Larijani became president in 2009, he worked with Raisi for a while. But after a period of disagreements, he dismissed him from his post in 2014. His profile at the time was that of a hardline anti-reformist, conservative, security and hardline image, loyal to the supreme leader Khamenei. Anyway, while continuing his career in other legal positions, he ran for the presidential election on May 19, 2017. The current president at that time was Hassan Rouhani. Raisi ran against him and lost. Rouhani received 57.1% of the vote, while Raisi received 38.3%. Rouhani was a much more moderate candidate. The turnout was low, other reformist candidates were disqualified. Yes, Raisi lost, but he had no intention of losing the next election. After a short vacation following his defeat, Khamenei appointed him Chief Justice in 2019. This was a very important opportunity and Racy was going to use it very well. As soon as he was put in the position, he became the biggest opponent of corruption. He made corruption trials public and prosecuted people close to the government and the judiciary. Around this time, he also began his presidential campaign. He traveled to almost all of Iran's 32 provinces. He presented himself as a defender of hard-working Iranians and said he would strengthen local businesses and save factories on the brink of bankruptcy under U.S. sanctions.
He ran the same campaign in the elections of 2021. The economy was already bad, even voter turnout was low, reformist candidates could not run, Rouhani could not run because he had served two consecutive terms and eight years. So Rezi did not exaggerate his promises. He said he would support the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the nuclear deal with the United States that had already been abandoned. If successful, the deal would lead to the lifting of U.S. sanctions and the scaling back of Iran's nuclear program. He promised to usher in a new era of financial transparency and anti-corruption, fight inflation, create at least one million jobs a year, build new housing, and provide special loans for first-time buyers. Let's come to election day. This was the presidential election with the lowest turnout since the revolution of 1979. More than half of the citizens did not participate. 48.8% of the electorate turned out. The new president of Iran is Ibrahim Raisi, who won 62% of the vote. Raisi was the first Iranian president to be approved by the United States before taking office, having been appointed in 2019. He is still on the U.S. blacklist. He was on the Death Council in 1988. He was part of the repressive mechanisms used against the Green Movement protests in 2009. Biden even said at the end of 2022, we will liberate Iran. Unfortunately, liberating Iran has now become a threat mechanism of Europe. Raisi responded to these words by saying, Iran was liberated 43 years ago, and it is determined not to fall into your captivity. I would like to briefly explain the electoral system in Iran because it has some interesting points. The president of Iran is elected once and serves for four years. The president is the highest directly elected official of the country. He is also the head of the executive branch. But there is one person who is more important than him, and that is the religious leader. In Iran, elected officials cannot rise above the religious leader. The final word, the final decision always comes from the religious leader. According to the Constitution of the Islamic Republic of Iran, any Iranian citizen who believes in Shiite Islam and adheres to the Constitution, the guardianship ideology of Islamic jurists and the Islamic Republic can run for president. But not everyone can run in the elections. There is something called the Guardian's Council. There is also the Election Monitoring Agency, EMA. These two organizations vet the candidates who want to run and they only allow a very few people to run. The reasons why people are not allowed to run are not made public. They are explained directly to the candidate. There are no restrictions on women's candidacy in Iran, meaning that women can also run. But no woman has so far been approved by the Guardian Council. The council's only response to the reactions is, we have not eliminated any of them because they are women. Anyway, once approved by the council, the candidates run for election. 50% plus one wins the election. Raisi became the eighth president of Iran with 62% of the vote. The fact that even former President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad was not allowed to run in this election and that some candidates were disqualified days before the election led the country to think that Raisi was actually running unopposed. The calls to boycott the election were answered by the low turnout. Now we can come to what has happened in recent days. The US and Israel welcomed the victory of the conservative Raisi in Iran with regret because Raisi is a distant figure to the US. In January, he warned the two states, I warn America and the Zionist regime, which have a direct role in all the crimes that are taking place in Palestine and Gaza, that you will pay a bitter price for this crime and other crimes you have committed. On the night of April 13th, Iran attacked Israel with drones and missiles. Air raid sirens sounded in Israel and people crowded into shelters. Many Iranian drones and missiles were destroyed. Many of them were shot down even before they reached Israeli territory. Iran announced that some military targets were hit. So how did it all start? On April 1st, Israel launched an airstrike on Iran's consulate in the Syrian capital Damascus. Seven members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, including two generals, were killed in the attack. Iran had reacted to the attack and vowed to retaliate. According to Israel, Iran sent more than 300 UCAVs and missiles towards Israel. The Israeli army spokesperson also said that only a small number of the 110 ballistic missiles fired reached the country. 
Another Israeli source said that 170 UCAVs and 30 guided missiles were sent towards Israel and that none of them reached the country. None of these Israeli assessments have yet been confirmed. U.S. jets are also on Israel's side in full force. While Joe Biden strongly condemned the attack and told Benjamin Netanyahu that the country had his full support, a CNN report said that Biden told Netanyahu that the U.S. would not support an attack against Iran. After the events, Arab countries called for restraint, while Macron said, we must stand by Israel. British Foreign Secretary Cameron called on Israel to think with its head, not its heart, and said Iran's attack was a double defeat. Speaking to Iranian state television, Chief of General Staff Mohammad Bakari said, The operation has been successfully completed. We see this operation as a complete result and we have no plans to continue the operation. He added that in the event of a new Israeli attack on Iran, they would launch a broader attack on Israel. Israel's response to this attack is somewhat ambiguous. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu convened the war cabinet to discuss the latest situation. Before the meeting, Benny Gantz, I have already told you about him, you can watch that video if you are curious, said, we will build a regional coalition, we will make Iran pay for this at the right time and date for us. However, Netanyahu was planning an immediate retaliation, but after a phone call with US President Joe Biden, rumors began to circulate that he had abandoned his plan. With this attack, I tried to tell you as much as I could about Ibrahim Raisi, who increased the already high regional tensions and made those who heard the news think, I wonder if there will be a war this time. I would like to make a suggestion again for those who watched the whole video. If you are interested in these issues, if you want to follow the agenda closely, we have many videos that will appeal to you on our GZT YouTube channel. We have activated a special join button for you on our channel. If you want to benefit from special privileges and support us, we invite you to become a chief editor. You can join us by clicking the join button and you can have the advantages provided by the join feature. I am Sena Ozier. Thank you for watching this episode of Profile. Before starting the video, if you would like to thank us for our efforts, you can subscribe to our channel and thank you for your comments on the videos. We need you to subscribe so that we can do more and better.